Hey, we are so blessed and excited to have Sandra Cose. I should have asked you how to say your name before we hit record, but I feel like I'm on the right track. Um, so you can correct me in a minute, but this is rising through for you who might just be joining us. My name is Colleen Tatum, and I really love to, first of all, provide this as a resource to people to help them while they're maybe having a minute. I definitely had some minutes over the past decade with um, economy changing, wildfires, just some crazy stuff happening. And podcasts were really a way for me to stay sane. Hearing other people's stories of rising through struggles really helped me do a lot of the personal development that I needed to do, really helped me have hope and faith in those moments. And so I just love learning other people's stories because everything that we go through, we can use it as a tool to help others, I believe. And Sandra is an expert on that subject. She's going to teach us a bunch. But Sandra, first of all, did I butcher your name? <laughs> no, you didn't. You butchered it. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's Coos. Coos. Sandra Coos. Okay. <laughs> I said Cose. I'm like thinking, I don't know, like Frenchish. Who knows? Who knows in this day and age? It could be any number of languages. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> but no, it's simple Coos. Coos. So okay. happy to be here. Coos. I love it. So my maiden name was Crummy which was a very different name, kind of like Coos maybe is. Yours is kind of cooler than Crummy was. Um, but when I was getting married, I always thought, oh my goodness, everyone will know how to say Tatum. It's going to be so easy. Um, so excited to leave Crummy behind just because people were always very confused that that was indeed a real last name. Indeed, it was a real last name that people could have. Um, so I thought people would understand Tatum, but they don't. So probably, you know, you encounter that a lot of people not knowing how to say your name. Um, but I think in this day and age, I don't know, all names, I feel like, can be interpreted differently depending on what background you come from. And you actually come from Germany originally. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. That is amazing. So you grew up in Germany. And then when did you immigrate to Canada? Or did you immigrate somewhere else first? How did that go? Well... Love brought me to Canada. I met my husband online by chance. And three and a half years later, we decided to tie the knot. And that's now 19 years ago. And so he's Canadian. And that's how I ended up in Ontario. And now back to his roots, Newfoundland. That's so cool. So love brought me to Canada. Not me personally, my parents. My mother came from Texas. She was in Canada visiting her father on her summer break. Her father was working in Canada. My father is from Northern Ireland and they met and then fell in love and never went home. <laughs> so we're both in Canada because of love. <laughs> it's so wonderful. I love that. Yeah, it's a really cool. I mean, I'm really lucky. I feel like that we ended up in Canada. Um, it's a great place for people that are listening. Um, you know, no place is, is perfect, but I feel like Canada's got a lot of pros going for them. Um, but the transition from Germany to Canada couldn't have been easy either. Let's no. be honest. It was something else. <laughs> I mean, the people themselves let's say you're in germany at a bus stop and someone just randomly talks to you you hold your purse closer because you think he's going to try and rob you here okay. it's normal that you start a conversation you know you're friendly you could go to a person's house and say can i use your phone or could i use your bathroom real quick in the middle of nowhere you can't do that in germany okay so that in itself was very difficult then what i really find fascinating is how Canadians or Americans see a hundred years as a long time. And in Germany, they think a hundred kilometers is a long distance, <laughs> right? It's so true, right? It's so um, true, you know, uh, yeah, because yeah, Germany is so much smaller than Canada. Canada is like, you know, days, days and days to drive across Canada, right? <laughs> Girl from Windsor to St. John's, I know. <laughs> yes, and then Newfoundland, living in Newfoundland, for people that don't know Newfoundland, Newfoundland, 
as you know, many states and provinces have distinct cultures, right? Like America or Canada is not one culture across the country, especially because it is so large. But Newfoundland especially has a very distinct culture, dialect. Everything is just different in Newfoundland. It really is almost like a, a, a country of its own, right? Yes, it is. And it's so beautiful. It is beautiful. It is beautiful. Um, and it has its own, uh, you know, traditions and things like that to learn about, which are very, very um, still prevalent, which is really cool because uh, for many provinces, you know, you've got a lot of different things happening, but they don't have maybe as distinct of a culture, but Newfoundland has a distinct culture in a way that some other places don't which is really cool so a whole new transition for you again you moved to Canada but now yeah. you moved to Newfoundland which is like moving to a different country again <laughs> so Sandra you are an author um you help people learn how to heal from trauma um what what is the name of your book Sandra journey to yourself right yeah it's a trilogy journey to yourself Book one is published. Book two is in the works. And book one is Journey to Yourself, How to Heal from Trauma, written by someone who did. Okay. Which means it's part of my story. And I unravel the mystery of trauma oh. to bring understanding what it really is to take the fear out of it. Because we only fear what we don't understand. And once you understand what trauma really is, you're not afraid of it anymore. And you can actually go to work and start healing. Okay. Hmm, that's really a different way of looking at it that I haven't heard where you said trauma is really being afraid. Um, is that what you said? I think. Okay. <laughs> and that's right. I, I have not I'm heard that before. That. So, so can you unpack, trauma, unpack that a bit? Yeah. The term trauma is frightening because when you're dealing with trauma, you're overwhelmed. You're in a constant dark hole you don't know what's left or right. You don't know how to get out of it because your emotions are against you. Your body is against you, especially when it comes to intimacy of the trauma. It's a very important subject because your body is like not leaning in. Your body is saying, nope, been there before, not doing it. And then there's nothing you can do during a trigger. But the thing is, you don't understand why. You don't understand how to get through this. So on my healing journey, I learned so much about trauma, what it is, what it isn't, what really happens when we're being triggered, how we can get out of a trigger. So my journey taught me a lot of what I needed to know about trauma. And it just makes sense. Trauma makes so much sense once you see the little pieces. Mm. But then it's not something you don't understand anymore because it's simple. A trigger is a guiding light to what, what you need to heal within yourself. You follow that trigger and you know where the root cause is that you need to work on. So it's a very simple roadmap once you understand it. And I'm trying to, with my book, teach people how to understand trauma and themselves in the process. I, okay, that was a beautiful line. Trauma is a guiding light to what you need to heal. That's beautiful. As opposed to thinking trauma like the triggers associated with trauma or something that we just, and this is how I think most people approach it um, without being intentional is we just trying to avoid that trigger, right? Instead mm -hmm. of trying to root out what is the real cause of the trigger and then how to heal and fix that. Is that kind of what you're describing? Yes. Okay. Most people... They try to avoid negative emotions. So they don't want to look into They want to be happy all the time. But the thing is, it's the negative emotions that show us what needs healing. If there wasn't anything we needed to heal, there wouldn't be any negative emotions and we would be happy all the time. So focusing on the negative emotions, understanding them, releasing what is causing those negative emotions. So the triggers, the memory of the trauma, you release them and they're gone and they don't come back. Whereas normally we we were taught to just suppress it, just suck it up and live your life. Well, this only works so long. And at some point, everything comes rushing back. It's like the, the tower moment, you know, the tower card in the tarot, like 
something is exploding and your life is in shambles because everything is coming back. Yeah, I mean, really, trauma is like, if you have an infection in your arm or or your toe, you can cover it up uh, for so long. (laughs) But the infection is continuing to grow and fester. And the only way to heal that is to dig it out right you it's not going to go away any other way you've got to root it out and heal it or else you're going to lose your leg (laughs) like it's not it's not something that's just going to go away it can literally kill you right an infection can kill you uh you know i'm reading a book right now about um foot binding and you know a character in the book died and it was saying that one in ten girls would die from foot binding which was a practice in ancient china Um, for those that don't know, but it caused a lot of infection. And, you know, your foot is something that is, you know, maybe a little bit separate to you, you might not think that, you know, an ingrown toenail or something could kill you, but it can because anything like that, any event that you don't deal with is going to come up, it might take longer, um, depending on the size of the injury, but definitely, it's something that you have to address. But we're not taught how to address these things. There's no class in school. At least I did not have a class in school on how to deal with these. There's no mental health classes. Um, So seeing that and having a book about that is like, you know, obviously most people don't feel equipped to do something like that to become not only a healer of themselves, but a healer of others. I would love to hear, um, what was that journey? How did that ever happen, Sandra? Well, I guess to tell the journey, I should probably start by listing what happened to me to get to an understanding of what I had to work through. Okay. I was molested when I was 12. I was sexually harassed when I was 14. I was bullied in school between the age of 16 and 17. Not just one or two kids, it was almost the whole class. Hmm. Then I was sexually assaulted multiple times between the age of 19 and 25. I was raped at 22. And if that wasn't enough, when I went to see a psychologist in my mid-20s, because I realized that I needed healing because I didn't like the person I had become, he dismissed me after our initial session saying, well, I believe you already worked through it all. What am I supposed to do? And well, that day I hit rock bottom. But the thing was rock bottom is you have two choices. You can stay down there or you can climb back out. Mm-hmm. I don't know what to do that day, but I decided to climb back out. And as I was climbing out, I was healing Now, when I was healing, I didn't realize that what actually happened was I was healing myself. I just had different aha moments. Things made sense. I learned that trauma healing is an inside job, which means it's all about self-reflection. So why do I behave like this? Why did this just make me upset? Mm -hmm. Things that I realized, for example, was that I was sabotaging each and every relationship I was ever in. So if you ever seen the movie, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, that could have been me. <laughs> <laughs> so every relationship. And at one point I realized that and I started to question why I behave. Why do I need to constantly text or call them all of a sudden? Why do I feel like they don't love me and I don't trust them for no reason? You know, so I started to question those things. And then I decided that this, I'm not going to have another relationship until I'm the person I like to be in a relationship. And I must have done something right because three months later, I met my husband. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) But anyway, how did I become a healer? Yeah, I Uh, mean, you have a rock bottom day uh, and you begin healing. But like, uh, where do you even start? How does that? Most people, you know, it's easy to say. Um, and then I just started healing myself. But like, what were those first steps? Where did you even turn or know how to turn to find that resource within yourself and, and, and tools to help you through that? What, what, what did those early days really look like for you? Well, I had two profound moments that really gave me huge 
aha moments that really make me think and gave me tools that I needed. So first of all, I'm a very spiritual person. I'm a Reiki master. I work with the Akashic Records. I do tarot readings. So all of that, crystals and all of that. But in Germany, that was very frowned upon because Germany is still a very religious country. So I had a friend who was very spiritual and spiritually advanced. One day he saw me sitting on a couch, like total, total mess, depressed, defeated. And he stood in front of me, hands on his hips. And he said, get a quartz crystal already. And I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> but I did. And what I what we know, well, what I've learned about crystals, especially quartz crystal, is that it's called the master healer because it helps release the negative emotions and get positive emotions back in. And I used the crystal for three months and I started to feel better emotionally, lighter, more outgoing without really doing much, which was the beginning of my healing journey and my introduction to spirituality. Then my last ex-boyfriend before my husband, when he broke up with me, he said, you know, I've just been married to a woman with mental issues. I don't want to date another one. He said that as a fact, not mean or anything, not accusational. But the fact that he said that was the first time where I sat down and thought about what I'm doing in relationships. Because I was always blaming the other person. You know, it's their fault. They don't love me. They don't want me. They're not in shining armor. I hope you would be. You know, so yeah. and then I realized the things I'm doing. So that was the beginning of my self-reflection journey. That's when I started asking myself, okay, why do I behave like this? And I started to unravel that for myself. And then later came the trauma back up. You know, trauma always comes in intervals. It's not all at once. You know, you release one thing and then the next bit is coming up. It's like trigger release. You release a trigger here. This is gone. The next trigger comes to the surface to be released and so on and so forth. That's how my trauma came up in intervals. And I said, fine, I can't get rid of it. So let's find a way. And what I learned, the biggest lesson was that I was holding myself hostage. I was the one who was angry. Of course, I'm angry, you know, because I was raped. Who wouldn't be angry once you're in the survivor stage mm -hmm. i had to make peace with the knowledge that i would never get revenge and i realized that revenge was not the issue the issue was i was hurting and i knew i would never get retribution for it and that's where my understanding of trauma really started to take hold because i realized as long as i'm holding myself hostage i'm pulling myself back into the story the other guy probably already forgot about me, you know, but I was holding on to it. But I didn't punish him. I punished myself for holding on to that. And that realization was the starting point of really digging deep into my trauma and stopping holding myself hostage. I was liberating myself by releasing it. Yes. I think that was such a good explanation for someone because... Sometimes they look at people that said, and then, you know, that, that have done the healing journey and they say, and then I just healed myself. And you're like, what, <laughs> what the frick does that mean? Where do I start? I'm laying on my couch in total desperation. And, uh, all I can do is scroll Twitter <laughs> or scroll, scroll TikTok. I have no idea what that even means or looks like. Um, Thankfully, there's so many tools now online. You can, um, you know, consciously try and find some tools. TikTok actually has some great, great resources, but you have to even have the thought to do that, right? You have to start somewhere. And oftentimes we don't get to that point. We continue to live in that, that muck and that infection because we as humans, it's such a strange thing, right? You know, a rape is one moment in time, it's not to downplay it, but you know, the, the action happens, but somehow it really sticks with us in a way that no other physical act does, right? There's a physical nature of it, but there certainly is a whole nother psychological um, nature 
in the way that some other, um, you know, assaults or things don't affect us quite the same way. Of course, you know, that's not, that's an overgeneralization, but it's something that we really hold on to in a different way and it affects our, our psyche. And that wanting revenge or retribution is something that so many people focus on, right? I, I see it time and time again, and it, it's a really dangerous place mentally because um, it's not probably going to happen, right? And certainly we see uh, people being encouraged to go to the police and things like that, which can be helpful, but also can create a whole entire other trauma. Because at this point in time, um, justice is probably not going to come, right? Most people do not, even if they're charged, do not get convicted. And even if they get convicted, they don't seem to serve sentences that are uh, in relation to the crime if we compare it to other sentences. And so there's this encouragement in our society, I think, from people to seek retribution, to, to go and make them pay. And that in itself can cause trauma, at least in my case, certainly my story. Um, you know, I, I was um, sexually assaulted as a child over a long time by a babysitter. And there was another child involved and that, that child was encouraged to go to the police. And they were really set up with the thought that like, this was going to make it better <laughs> somehow. Like if you just go to the police and then they're going to get charged and then they're going to go to prison and then everything's then somehow that makes it better. That makes it okay when it really doesn't. And um, they were actually found not guilty. Right. And that in itself, I think was a whole nother trauma right? Because now not only did you have this thing happen to you, but you've gone through the trauma of the trial. You've gone through the trauma of all those things, telling your story to, to strangers. And then for someone to say not guilty was really something that for the other person, I, I know it affected me, but I think it really put that person in a really dangerous state because it was like they were told that what happened was okay. Um, and it isn't okay, but that feeling, that holding on to needing retribution or revenge and all those things is never going to change what happened, right? It's never really actually going to get at the root of the issue and identifying with yourself that I can't change what happened, right? You're saying this person probably forgot about you a long time ago, right? And exactly that, we're holding on to this emotion, this trauma in such a different way. And revenge is not going to solve it. Even if you did, you know, see this person go to jail forever, it's not going to solve the root of the issue. It's not going to solve your trauma. And um, doing the work, like you're saying, is is really what is going to solve it, Right. You said something about crystals. Okay, I know nothing. You said I use the crystal for three months. What in the, what does that mean? I like buy a crystal and I hold it. What am I doing? Okay. Well, for the longest time, crystals were laughed at for being woo woo science. Now, there are two German scientists who have actually proven that there is energy going between the brain and the crystal when a crystal is sitting next to the person's what? head. So there is something going on, most definitely. Yes. So how that was for me was my friend suggested I hold a crystal in my hand when I go to sleep. And at first, the first couple of days, I felt nothing. I just had a rock in my hand. Right. Then after a few more days it started to get warm i noticed a distinct different feeling then i felt like a pulsing between me and the crystal so it was like as if blood was pumping through my hands so like in heartbeat like intervals then sometimes i felt a tingle then sometimes i could not tell what is the crystal what is my hand as if they were melted together and that was before i knew all everything about spirituality so then there were times when i felt as if something was being pulled out of my arm, down my hand, and something being pushed back up. That was the energy being released and being pushed back. Wow. And 
sometimes I woke up in the morning and I just felt lighter as if like a rock was falling off of me you know it's it's really fascinating especially when you've never experienced working with crystals it's amazing I, because you're opening up to a whole new level of your being because we're all spiritual beings we have a physical mental emotional and spiritual body so we have an energy body that can be measured so and the crystals i see as rebalancing because every crystal helps with different things so for example you have an imbalance in your body and your, your body vibrates in a different way than if you were completely healed that's i guess the i don't know say a dark spot in your energy field and that vibrates on a different frequency now you take the crystal that works with whatever issue let us say physical mental emotional you have and use that crystal and it will re will rebalance that little spot to be healed again and vibrate in the same way as your energy body does naturally in a nutshell i mean it's such a huge oh topic God. It is right, and and I didn't know that there was a study about um, the energy around crystals. I mean, I guess someone probably is studying this thing now. I'm seeing it more and more, right? Um, I I was listening to a podcast. Ed Milet had a gentleman on. I I don't remember his name, but he he had done work with the uh, concept of grounding, and then they have scientific evidence of how this like truly is helping you. And the thought of just sticking your feet in dirt for twenty minutes sounds like mm -hmm. it, it doesn't in our western concept of of uh health it doesn't make sense but if you look back to the teachings um in ancient china chinese medicine if you look back to indigenous cultures there's certainly something there right and for us to think that suddenly we're detached from the world um as just this being that exists in the world, but we have no attachment energy wise, I think is short sighted, right? As we're starting to see studies come forward, putting scientific evidence behind these ideas of grounding or John Asaraf and, and different people have done um, some very scientific studies, even at a university level of study, proving connection between meditation and results in the physical world, right? Proving um, ability to heal or uh, overcome illnesses and things through these, these energies. And I guess it brings to mind, you know, the telephone or the internet. <laughs> Certainly, if I had explained to someone 300 years ago that suddenly we would be talking to each other through the interwebs, uh, it, it sounds insane. And I would probably have been at risk for being told that I was insane and being locked away. To think that we could talk to people through air. <laughs> mm -hmm. makes no sense and I don't understand how electricity works and I don't understand how the internet works but that's okay I can still believe in the results because I can see that we are talking to each other right now on zoom on the internet right and so I think yeah. um, some of these things that we're starting to come into more mainstream need to be noted for their merit there are tools available to us and you mentioned something about Germany being a religious country and certainly in different parts of Canada and the U.S. or different churches uh, it's still taught as it's it's maybe evil rooted or not something to be played with and I really look at it like it's a tool um certainly even electricity there was people that said electricity was evil right and then we just progress right. and we realize electricity is not evil it's a tool right like anything you can probably find good and bad in it but it's a tool, right? And um, I think that's a really interesting thing. I have not done anything with crystals. And now I'm going to go buy myself some rocks or some crystals. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can know that you have a tiny quartz crystal in your computer and in your phone. Okay. Okay. In my phone. Okay. Well, I'm just going to hold my phone. <laughs> Yeah, that's <laughs> I'm going to definitely spend some time in that. I have not heard that. Um, people may be laughing at me. Like, of course, you should have known this by now, but I, I really haven't. I've heard about grounding and meditation and, you know, I've seen people use crystals, but I was like, I was like, it's a rock. I don't get it. Right. So thank you for clarifying for that for me. I, hopefully it was really helpful probably for some other people too. And um, I just want to ask you a little bit about your book for a minute. Um, you know, you're talking about, um, 
healing and, and removing triggers. And you, you mentioned, uh, how to get out of a trigger and maybe you can't maybe it's too much of a concept for the podcast but if someone's listening what's one little first step or three you know a few little steps that they can make where if something is triggering them first identifying that it's a trigger that their reaction isn't congruent to what's really happening maybe and then how do they start to reframe that for themselves Okay. Well, yes. The first thing is to really recognize you are being triggered and understanding that whoever or whatever just triggered you, it's not their fault because the trigger comes from something that already happened a long time ago and that was never healed. So let's say you have a partner and your partner says, I don't know, something and you just see red. So first of all, you have to realize you're just seeing red because you're being triggered. Then. When we're being triggered, we're overwhelmed. We don't even know what we're feeling. It could be rage, it could be anger, it could be feeling demeaned, anything. So we have to figure out what exactly are we feeling? Because anger, for example, is a mask for pain. So why do we hurt right now? Once we know that, then we can take a deep breath, to try and calm us down, take a step back, maybe take five minutes and then sit down and think about this trigger. Why did I feel like that? And then we look at what did our partner just say? What word was it that was triggering us? Okay, why was this triggering us? And then we think back to a time where we basically follow the trigger in our minds. Like we see a movie in our mind and say, okay, where did I feel like this before? And then we think and we think and we think until there's an image coming up of a situation that made us feel exactly like that. And we look at it from all sides until we understand it. Okay, so that's why I felt like this. Then we go on, is there another time where we felt like this before? And then we go further back until the next image comes up. And we analyze that and look at it and remember and why did we were, why were we made to feel like this? And we will keep on going until we get to the root cause. Usually it's in the childhood somewhere deep rooted triggers about something that a family member said and we took it on the wrong way and you know children we all go through that yeah or it might have been something real right and and you're you said I never want that in my life but now it's triggering you like there was an example as you're saying that um you know a lot of times I've been married over 20 years and uh the there's some fights that you continuously have, right? And you look at it and you think, maybe, maybe I'm being triggered. <laughs> and so just simple things can happen, right? Uh, a trigger for me the other day, uh, my husband took um, some sour cream or yogurt or something out of the fridge. And he said, oh, this is so old. And I was so triggered by that. Um, he was just saying, oh, this is really old and threw it in the garbage. But for some reason, because he said that to me, it triggered me to think that he was criticizing me, that I hadn't done a better job of managing the things that were in the fridge. So I started getting really mad at him. And I had to take a step back and think, I don't think he really intended it that way. I don't think he was really actually criticizing me. I just think he was literally saying, oh, this is really old and throwing it away. And I had to step back because for a minute there, I got really kind of triggered and mad. And I was starting to be annoyed with him because that was something that triggered me because in my childhood, I had always seen this the imbalance between men and women is something that really triggers me in general. I, I see it a lot. Um, I think I'm extra sensitive to it than other people are in, a, in our society, where still to this day, there's such an imbalance. And so um, that was something that I always kind of said, when I grow up, I'm not going to have that in my life. I'm not going to be submissive woman that has to manage the fridge ingredients or the grocery shopping or the dinner. So just that little comment, right? So if, if you're kind of thinking back over the past couple of weeks, um, even something that I, I had been recommended to do is start to write down some of those things, like write down maybe when you got angry. And then you can start to reflect on it and see a pattern of maybe it wasn't, my husband wasn't actually 
being mean to me. I was just being irrational in the moment. And then you can say, okay, now these are some things I need to go back and go through that triggering process. It's probably not, and you can correct me, but it's probably not realistic to think that you can go through that whole process in one go, right? It probably takes many conversations with yourself over time to try and figure out like what is actually really going on here and then how do I fix it right is that correct yes well it depends on how much it is connected to it I mean the first thing that popped up for me when you shared that little story was the feeling of not being perfect not good enough the feeling of I've made made a mistake that you yeah, weren't absolutely. aware of throw it out before he noticed so yeah i think good enough that's yeah, what not being good enough and also like why is it my responsibility to take care of the fridge management that just because i'm a woman that's because that's what comes up to me. just because i'm a woman i'm not supposed to be in charge of all these things that's not fair right <laughs> which is probably right, but at the same time something else deeper want right? to have it perfect yeah, yeah, exactly. You're so right. You're so Different right. Different so, things involved in this. Yeah. So it might not be the yogurt for you in your household. It might be something else, but maybe if things are continuously coming up, like you were saying in your relationships, you started to say, hmm, maybe if all of my boyfriends are not working out, it's maybe I'm choosing the wrong type of person, but also am I creating a dynamic that continues to prove out results that are not ideal? And how can I take responsibility for my involvement in that relationship? What am I doing to set a foundation of abuse or what am I doing to set a foundation of, you know, inadequacy or drama? <laughs> and how can I start to become you said a line, I think, how can I become the person that I would want to be in relationship with, right? Yeah. I had heard someone say before to write a list of everything that you want in a partner and then ask yourself, are you that person that would want to, like, if that person came across your plate, are you someone that they would want to be in relationship with? And to become that person so now you can attract that type of partner for yourself and uh do the work so that you can attract that type of person when you were doing that because it was only three months you said I think and then you found your your partner that's a short time span that's a huge revolution in a, a short time span um so maybe for people that are listening it doesn't have to be a long process <laughs> um <No idea. laughs> And so in that three months, you were doing all that. And then eventually you ended up writing this book. So what made you, what made you motivated or what made you feel qualified, I guess, even to write a book like that? Well, first I always loved writing. Now, if you had told me 10 years ago, I would write a book about trauma healing and I would have laughed. <laughs> I would have said no way. But the thing is, I've learned so much about trauma and trauma healing. And whenever I talk to someone, it was usually when I gave my Reiki sessions. And after the session, my client and I sat down so I could make sure they're grounded and everything, not feeling woozy. And they always opened up to me naturally as if I were a therapist. And I didn't ask for it. So I just talked about issues, what came up and trauma. And I always knew exactly what to say because for me, it made sense. And the more I talked to them, the more I realized they didn't know what I knew. And I was like, people need to know this. There are so many books out there that talk about trauma, written by psychologists and all this, you know, university jargon that no one knows what it means unless you have a dictionary. And I wanted to write a book from my perspective, what I've learned of trauma, because it made sense to me. And I wanted to share this knowledge. I wanted to show people, look, you can heal from trauma. It's not rocket science. It's not something you need to live with for the rest of your life. It's something that happened to you. You're allowed to let it go. And here's how you can do this. Take your life back, liberate yourself, live the best life ever, but start with the healing and here's how it's done. Which is why I not only talk about my story or unravel trauma in different ways. So to give you an example, for example, I talk about, hmm, let me see some of my chapters. 
like I talk about you're not broken because we think trauma broke us. Mm. No, it didn't. It did not break you. I talk about the complexity of the traumatized mind. I talk about coping mechanisms and unravel them. So alcoholism, drugs, bulimia, self-mutilation, what teenagers usually do a lot, like cutting themselves. Mm -hmm. So I really talk about and unravel that. I talk about separation of body and mind. I talk about different stories from my clients that I work through. Like how amazing it was to see the their healing journey while they worked with me, the transformation. To give oh, you an example, one of them great. was still into drugs and alcohol when we started working. And now she just celebrated three and a half years sober. Yeah. All from healing trauma. So things like that, that there's always that there shouldn't be judgment why we went into drugs or alcohol. There should always be to ask why happened. What happened? Absolutely, why absolutely. It's happen? not a choice. Not a choice. Exactly. It is a symptom. Uh, that's exactly. something we need to be very clear about in our society. It is drugs and alcohol are not a choice. People turn to those as a symptom of something else every time. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. For, so, I also found, sorry. No, go ahead. What I also found interesting in my journey and learning was trauma and the connection to allergies, trauma oh. and the connection to your hair. All very interesting subjects. And what I also do, I have a journaling technique in there and like 21 days where you can write in when you journal every day. I have exercises, room for notes. So I really make it an interactive workbook. I really like that because there's a lot of books. I read a lot of um, mindset, self-help, uh, getting better books. <laughs> and a lot mm -hmm. of them, like you said, are, are technical or they talk about the problem, but they don't tell you how to fix it right? Exactly. Or they tell you how to fix it at a super high level. Like when we were first starting out and you said, so I reached rock bottom and then I fixed myself. And it's like, okay, but <laughs> like, where does that start? <laughs> like literally tell it to mm -hmm. me, like I'm two years old because that's what I need. So I love something that is not only learning, but is a tool, a tool to help the person from step one to step two to step three and help them to actually do the work versus talk about doing the work. I love that, Sandra. It's so good. So what was the name of your book again? And then where is the easiest place for someone to find it? The book is called Journey to Yourself, How to Heal from Trauma. It's on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble. In Canada, you can also get it in polls and chapters. It's on the Ingram list. And um, yeah, I guess that's the uh -huh. easiest places to find it. I love it. I mean, everyone has Amazon. Uh, Coles and chapters is my favorite place. <laughs> this is not a paid advertisement, but if you can go there and walk around and have a little moment with yourself, I love the smell in a bookstore. I don't know about you, but I love to go yeah. have some time in there. And uh, your website is rise above your story, right? Rise above your story .com. What would right. someone find on your website? Sorry? What would someone find on your website? What they would find on my website is a link to work with me. I offer free consultations so we can get to know one another and see if we resonate. Because trauma healing is something very personal and you have to feel comfortable. Then you'll see the different ways I help my clients healing. You will find some very unique approaches like ancestral healing, generational healing. So I really go deep into the matter and really pick up every trauma we can find to help you live the best life possible because we're being held back by so many different things we don't even realize like limiting beliefs conditioned behavior what our parents taught us our grandparents all those little wise words that were always like keeping us down and <laughs> so i help in many different ways and all of them circle on trauma and i think you will find a lot of great information there not just to work with me but also for yourself my articles my youtube channel i try and share as much of my wisdom as i can so you can work on yourself by yourself too 
Okay. It sounds like a great resource. I mean, again, for those listening, it's riseaboveyourstory.com. Um, whether you go and get her book, I would encourage you to get her book. Um, whether you start working with her one-on-one, um, start with checking out the website and giving yourself some tools. I believe that everyone, whether you're thinking, hmm, I don't have any big traumas in my life. There's there's definitely, if you think about it the other way, are there triggers in your life? There are probably things regardless that are triggering you in your daily life that you may or may not be aware of and being able to work through those triggers and not allow it to trigger you anymore will help you to continue to be better, to be raise your emotional intelligence so that you can go out and be more successful in your relationships, in your business, in your work life. All of these things are connected. The better we can be, the more we can see ourselves clearly um, as a being and be able to do that work with ourselves, which is really probably the point of life, right? Um, the, the podcast rising through that, that's really the nut of it is that there's always going to be things in your life that are there that are not pleasant, but They can be something that we use as a tool to help us get better. They can happen for us, not to us. And we have to take an active participation in how we react to those things. And the the point of life, I really think, is to do that work, right? We aren't, whether you're spiritual or religious or not, there has to be a point to all of this. And it's not just for us to come to earth and, you know, go to school, get a job, pay some bills and die. There's more to it than that. Surely there is. (laughs) And part of it probably is doing the work and being able to rise through these things that happen in our lives. So thank you so much, Sandra. Um, It was very helpful. I'm going to go order some crystals right now and just, you know, hang out with them for a bit. (laughs) Uh, So that was really helpful to me. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, And uh, I know that the people listening got a lot of value out of it. So thank you for giving us your time today. Thank you so much for having me, Colleen. I enjoyed it. Awesome. Thank you.